Uh, thank you all for taking time and coming to the summit today and especially to this talk. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Rupa Tangirala. I'm the engineering manager at Netflix. We have a wonderful cloud database engineering team and we provide Cassandra as a service. Uh, our team actually primarily manages all Cassandra clusters, uh, upgrades them, does um, data modeling, capacity planning, monitoring, anything related to Cassandra we try to serve as a service. Um, without further ado, let's go in. Uh, the topic of my presentation is Active Active Cassandra Behind the Scenes. Um, a few slides about Netflix, right? You all know DVD, uh, Netflix started as a DVD by mail company. And um, within a few years, we actually have expanded into online streaming and are pretty much on all the devices. Uh, name it, you name it, we are on it. Be it gaming console, be it HDTV, be it Blu-ray player, tablets, phones, we are pretty much on all the devices and try to provide very rich content, right? Uh, we have uh, very uh, thousands of titles in the library. Along with that, we try to have our own originals, actually, which add flavor. And a lot of people, these are uh, like House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, are pretty popular titles and people like to do binge watching, right? And it becomes very critical as a service, we need to be always up and running. So high availability is very critical for us and that's what we'll be covering. How did we achieve that? Um, so let's start. Uh, active, active, right? Uh, what is active, active? What do we mean by that? Just a simple definition and also called dual active. It is a phrase to describe network of independent processing nodes connected to a replicated database, right? In case of failure, a failed node, uh, the request either go to the existing nodes or are load balanced across the remaining nodes. Uh, so this is a very high level definition. Uh, why, why do people want to go active active, right? So as uh, companies which start primarily as a small business and start in their own data center, uh, they actually have, um, you know, they, they are solving enterprise IT solutions. They, they are architected around uh, having their own data center, their own IT ops. Uh, but as they scale and grow, it becomes very critical that they need to uh, go to web scale solutions, right? Uh, and for web scale solutions, uh, because it's very critical for their application as well as their infrastructure to be rapidly scaling and even then be highly available. So high availability is really very important for any online business to succeed. So one such effort at Netflix was an active, active implementation. And this, doc, this talk will actually walk you through uh, uh, active, active, our active, active implementation from Cassandra's perspective. So what, what was the process we used for doing active, active? What were the validations we had to do? And what were the takeaways? What will we be doing different next time? So let's look at a few failure scenarios, right? Uh, there are a lot of ways in which things can fail even in cloud or in data center. So does an instance fail? Yes, it can. It can be a ba bad hardware or it can have some latent issues or it can also be related to some push on that instance, right? Uh, and how do we test uh, bad instances? We actually test it through Chaos Monkey. Um, does a zone fail? Zone in Amazon is a data center, right? So it, the failure, zone failures are pretty rare, but they do happen. Um, and it can be very specific to routing issues, right, or DC specific issues. Or it can also be application specific issue within a zone. And how do we test it? We actually use Chaos Gorilla to test the zone failures. Uh, does a region fail? Region failures are really very, very rare, right? But they do happen. Uh, we have been hit, Netflix actually as a company, we uh, push the limit of um, software and hardware as well. And uh, we have seen um, failures in the past which uh, maybe, you know, even in the data center when we were running in Oracle, we would see a lot of failures which, which are uh, one in a million chance of happening, but we will get hit, right? So region failures are similarly like that. We were hit, I will cover the history behind it. But uh, region failures also happen and it is very specific to mostly uh, region-wide configuration issues. Right? And how do we test that? We actually test it using Chaos Kong. So, so CRUSC is, you know, eventually everything will fail, right? So uh, what defines a service 
uh, is how they architect around failures and even then try to be highly high, try to be highly available. So it's very important that you have to keep your services up and running by embracing isolation and redundancy, right? So uh, what do we mean by isolation? Uh, isolation is basically uh, sharding and partitioning the regions in such way, such that changes in one region do not impact the others, right? Uh, regional outages in one region do not have any effect on the other region, and network partition events net like network partitioning uh, between the regions do not affect the functionality or operations. What do we mean by redundancy? Redundancy is basically making more of pretty much everything, right? You have uh, zones and you have regions, so you distribute your services and your uh, backend in such a way that they are spanning multiple regions and multiple uh, zones so that you get more availability. So a brief history of why we had to look into active-active or why what what was the triggering event which actually made us uh, go active active? So uh, back in uh, Christmas Eve, uh, in the year 2012, uh, Netflix suffered a multi-hour outage. And it was actually a regional outage uh, related to a, a maintenance process where data was inadvertently run against production. Uh, and it took a while. It took out our front load balancers, elastic uh, load balancers. and it it was actually a very bad experience because customers were not able to stream. Uh, so we, and as a service, we actually strive for uh, being highly available. We want to uh, be different in that way. And it became very critical. So we went back to the drawing board and you know, thought through the process. How can we use Cassandra's architecture and uh, make it uh, work for us and create a solution which will actually make us very highly available and agile, right? So if you look at this architecture, uh, and there are a lot of components. I know it can be confusing. But I want you to focus on the lowest layer, where I'm showing the multi-regional Cassandra cluster, which is spanning the two regions. One is US East 1, and the other is US West 2. And we have a replicated crash in front. And then you see all the mid-tier services and the different apps and the front ends, uh, which are actually taking in your request. So um, in a very stable state, based on your uh, location, your request is geo-routed to either US East or US West, right? So when there is no problems and both regions are highly available, you, you will see the traffic is splitting. And based on your location, you will either be, for example, if you are in California, you will be going to US West too. And if you are in East Coast, you will be hitting US East. So this is a good state, happy state. And when there is a failure, or say we had the same uh, ELB issue again, all the traffic will be routed to the region which is healthy. And this is pretty seamless, right? And suddenly you have, uh, you know, it, 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 within a few seconds, uh, your request go to the region which is highly available, and then um, there is no disruption to the service or the customer experience. So this, this is the basic uh, theme, like what was the history and uh, why did we go uh, with Active Active? Uh, now I'll go over the process actually. What, what are the different steps from Cassandra's perspective which we had to uh, make sure that Active Active would work? So um, let's go over the process. The very first process is actually uh, identifying all your clusters which need to be extended. So uh, think about it like as a company, we, are, uh, have, we, have, we have to maintain 90 plus clusters. And uh, not each and every application needs to be uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, not each and every application needs to be used to service a particular request. There are a lot of applications like logging or some batching applications which don't need to be active active. So you have to work with your application owners to identify which data needs to be replicated. And uh, this seems a very simple task, but it takes a lot of cycles. So I said, let, let's call that out. Uh, then, uh, we, as we know, as you know, we are running in Amazon environment. We, uh, for an island cluster, you would be using, if you are an island cluster, you would be using EC2 snitch. EC2 snitch is basically using private IPs for its communication between the zones. Um, so when you have to convert it into multi-regional cluster, you have to actually change the snitch to use EC2 multi-region snitch, and which will use public IPs to talk across the regions. Now, the think of it um, uh, in Amazon, um, a rack 
as a zone and a region as a data center. That's how it's configured, right? So um, you, once you do this, this is a YAML change. It would need a restart. Uh, but this change is very, very important. The, it doesn't mean that in EC2 multi-region snitch, uh, the private IPs are not used at all. Uh, within a region, uh, which is the listen address, Cassandra will still use the SSL port and use the private IPs. But it is only for the cross-regional traffic it is using the public IPs. This is another configuration change which you need to do, which is actually uh, we have exposed this in Preem open source. Um, it is Preem multi-region enabled to true. Uh, basically what it will do is it, it actually makes sure that you are able to communicate across, across the regions. So initially what, uh, if you are using the EC2 snitch, you will be using the storage port and using private IPs, right? So enabling this property, actually it creates the re required firewall holes so that uh, your cluster or your nodes are able to talk and look at other nodes in the other region using public IPs. So basically converting that port from storage port to SSL port. This is specific to Amazon. Yeah, you had a question? Priam is a, actually a sidecar which manages Cassandra. It's open source. That is developed by uh, our developers in Netflix. So basically, it will manage Cassandra. It, will, it can start Cassandra. It can stop. It does the backups, restores. So it's basically edit functionality, which is not there in Cassandra, out of the box. Then you actually will do the rolling restart. Because you have done one YAML setting, and uh, the other is a security group setting, then you would have to do a rolling restart for your snitch changes to come into place. Uh, so when you are doing this rolling restart, the importance of the previous slide is both your SSLs and the SSL storage ports needs to be there in, so that they can talk. Because it, the cluster is in a mixed mode for some time, right? Because you are doing rolling restart of one node at a time. Some of the nodes will be using EC2 snitch and some of the nodes will be using EC2 multi-region snitch. So in order to avoid any confusion, it's better to have both the ports and both IPs exposed, private as well as public IPs. The next step is actually spinning up cluster, spinning, spinning up the nodes in the new region. As you see, like here we have highlighted that, uh, say for example, you have a three-node Cassandra cluster, and your application is in US East. This is the live cluster, um, it's taking all the live traffic, right? And you'd made the snitch changes, you did a rolling restart for this uh, US East side, and now you spin up nodes in the US West too. Now what this becomes is a one global ring, right? The right side nodes don't have the data yet. They just have, uh, they are just part of the ring, but without any data. So this is, uh, you have to actually spin up those nodes. Once those nodes are up and part of a ring, what you do is you actually update the key space. If your cluster has five key spaces or 10 key spaces, you have to update each and every of them individually. Uh, the reason is like you have to add the new region, which you are trying to add to the global ring. Um, in the strategy option. So that, you know, because now after this point, when, uh, after you do this update and schemas are in agreement, whatever writes you do in the US East region will at automatically be replicated into US West too. So the writes, th this actually enables your write to go, um, you know, it is your, the new region which has been added, it's taking all the live write traffic. But I did not show any application there. So we are not ready yet. We cannot just spin up apps in the new region because the historical data is missing, and there are other things which need to be done. We'll go through. So um, after this update, what you need to do is basically to get all the history back, right? You can run the node tool rebuild command on the new region. In our case, it was the US West 2 region. So we ran the node tool rebuild command um, so that it brings up all the historical data. So this uh, command can be run uh, parallelly depending upon what are your instance types. So we had a few clusters which were SSDs and small enough. We ran them parallelly. We did not see any performance on the live cluster impacted because of the rebuild. Because it's just streaming the data. It's similar to Bootstrap, but it's actually much quicker. Uh, before this rebuild was there, like we, rebuild was introduced, I think, in one, I'm not sure exactly which version. But we had, we had to extend prior to one as well. And in those scenarios, we were actually using repair. And think about it like the new cluster, new uh, region does not have any data set. And the repair was actually taking very, very long because it has to populate all the data. So this really helped. No, no tool rebuild uh, is a great tool. Uh, also, whenever we see that sometimes Cassandra doesn't come up with 
data due to whatever re reason, uh, we do use node tool rebuild uh, to basically repopulate the data set. It gives us a, you know, a faster edge to have the data seeded and then we can do the repair. Uh, the next process is running the node tool repair. Node tool repair uh, is very, very, uh, you have actually, I think most of you who are using Cassandra very seriously and have production installations uh, would understand like this repair is really, really, uh, it takes time, uh, but it is very necessary, right? Because eventually Cassandra is, is an eventually consistent system and um, repair is the, there are repair and other knobs as well to make the data consistent but you should definitely run repairs. Uh, so this was the whole process of making your one live cluster and extending, taking it and extending into the new region where you want to set up Active Active, right? Uh, so with, uh, we, we, knew, we knew the process, we said okay, we are okay now. But then, you know, our developers and all our application owners, they had a very important question. They said okay, we are, think, we are actually um, tasking Cassandra for the replication and we trust Cassandra's replication, but how long does it take for a write to replicate to the other region? What, uh, because we are using it for active, active, that is very critical. We don't want uh, a lot of delay, and in what scenarios do delay happen? If we identify them, we can work around it, right? So I'll go over the validations which we did to make sure Cassandra as a service and Cassandra as a technology for active, active would work, and if we'll be able to answer any questions. Uh, so for this, what we did was we actually uh, did a global benchmark, Cassandra global We took a very uh, heavy write intensive application and uh, we restored it from backup, followed the same procedure which I ex explained to you in the previous slides, the whole process of extending a US East cluster into US West 2. So it was 18 terabyte backup data. We actually back, uh, we restored it from S3, uh, extended the cluster into US West 2 and we just kept running load. Right. So the validation what we wanted to do was we did one million writes in one region and uh, read those one million back. And we, it's just, we, after 500 millisecond we waited but it's not needed, like it's just uh, to prove that whatever reads you do, and we did it with CL1, that is the main difference here. Because we wanted to see if even if we don't use quorum or higher consistency, if we just use CL1, and just write uh, in one region, does all the data go through? Are, like how many times do the, like how many records don't make it through the other region? What percentage of inconsistency do we have? Because we don't have those tools exposed yet. Uh, it's very important question people keep asking, how much entropy do I have in the system? When should I be running repair? When should I, I should not be running repair? So um, since we didn't have all the tools in place, uh, we actually ran this one million benchmark. And we, this is uh, thinking all nodes are up. There was no network partition, no issues uh, at all with any of the nodes. We actually were able to read back all the one million without any, uh, without, with no data loss. So that actually helped us validate that, okay, Cassandra replication does work and it can be used for active actor. The other thing we wanted to prove was, how does Cassandra perform when there's a thundering herd? So when you have two regions in place and one region is taking, to both the regions are taking 50-50% of traffic and suddenly there's an, there's an issue with the region, you have to fail over to the other region, right? So suddenly your, the region uh, which is active and healthy, it receives double the traffic. So we wanted to see what kind of uh, um, problems we have and what are the effects on latencies uh, on the application side when we actually move the traffic. So we did test for thundering herd too. I'll show you some graphs in the future slides which will actually show you the things we were measuring. But this is some, one of the uh, important validation we need to do whenever we want to make sure you, know, you have enough capacity and the cluster can handle. Uh, test for retries. So if your one region is not performing well and uh, it is slow or it's uh, latent, uh, you, your application is bound to make a lot of retry calls. And so uh, more, even one is thundering herd, and over that you would also have retries in place when the traffic is moved to the newer region. So this, uh, we also wanted to make sure that when we are doing all these retries, uh, what is the effect on latencies? How, how is the application behaving? So for all these tests, what are the metrics we were using? We were basically uh, focusing on 95th and 99th read latency, 
And this is both at the Cassandra coordinator level as well as at the client level. Because it's very important that these both should match. Uh, if there is a mismatch, that means either you have some bottleneck in your app or there's something going on at the Cassandra side, right? So this is one thing which uh, is critical. Um, drop metrics on Cassandra. So if Cassandra is under stress or it, is, it doesn't have enough capacity, you will see that you know, it starts dropping, the coordinator will start dropping metrics, be it mutations, be it reads. reads. There are so many um, the metrics there. So it's in, we actually, uh, in, in our team, we monitor this uh, metric uh, and that actually shows us the health of the cluster. Uh, look for exceptions. We looked actually, are there any exceptions growing? When we are moving this traffic over, when we are saying the, doing the thundering herd testing, are there any exceptions on Cassandra? How is Cassandra behaving? How is the heap? Like is heap a regular uh, seesaw uh, pattern or is it actually going up, causing latencies and other kinds of problems? So we did want to capture that. Uh, what are the thread spending? So this is another indicator if a system is actually um, having difficulty coping up, you will see the thread spending increasing on a node. Uh, so we have, like I think if you saw Christos' talk, uh, we have Atlas as a monitoring system and we have ways to you know, pinpoint a particular node which actually is a troublesome node or is causing issues. So during all these tests, we were measuring these metrics to see the health uh, of Cassandra. Uh, just a quick slide on the configuration for the test. Uh, the back Cassandra configuration was 24 node SSD cluster. Um, we used 220 um, client instances, the app layer, and 70 plus JMeter instances to just drive the load. Right. So that uh, in the uh, it's three replicas in each region, right? So we, as we extended this region, it became six replicas total. Right. So so that's the other thing. As in when you add more regions and you add more replicas, you keep adding more data set. So your cluster grows, but uh, then. Uh, so the next slide, this one actually is showing you the normal load. So that particular production cluster we had in prod, it was taking around 12K reads per second, and it was taking around 1,000. It was a batchy write operation, so it was going up to 1.2. So uh, since we wanted to test for thundering herd, we did, like we started at 25 to 25K reads per second, and around 700 writes per second. And you see that sudden bump, because we did want it to be sudden. We didn't want it to be gradual, because no, we know gradually caches fill up, uh, the, late, uh, the performance improves, but what if there is a sudden increase? How is the performance? So you see those that thundering herd uh, effect there. And these are the latencies. These latencies don't mean anything for us, for this particular application. Um, before it was 15 milliseconds, and then uh, during the thundering herd, when we increased the read ops, it became to 45 milliseconds, which is very good for a 95th, and um, 99th went from 40 to 80. But uh, the point I'm making here is it's, this is very specific to the application which we were using and the load we were generating, the payload it was having. So it, it, these numbers can change for your app, right? So these, uh, each application will have different SLA. It will have different um, sensitivity to latency. So you have to make an effort to know your clusters and see what is, what is uh, their ceiling, right? So this is another thing, right? We, we did want, for this particular cluster, we wanted to know how much maximum when can we drive the read ops and write ops without impacting the latency. For example, these guys, they had um, uh, SLA of below 99th to be below 100 millisecond. And if it is more than that, they didn't want, like that means there's some problem, right? For them, they have the timeout set and all uh, according to that. So um, it's very important that you determine the ceiling for your clusters. Um, and each cluster will be different depending upon the application. Um, test for network partition. So this was also important. Uh, when you have two regions and you are saying that we will be using it for active-active, uh, there will be instances when one region is not able to talk to other, right? So uh, what we did for this particular case was we did it in test and we um, updated the IP tables so that uh, the nodes are not able to talk on the SSL storage port across region. And we could actually mimic a region outage. So in one region we saw that all the other nodes in the other regions were marked down. So this was only seeing the local <coughs> ring. Uh, 
we actually, we, I'll show you in the takeaways, but we did find out a lot of cases where um, people were using uh, Quorum and that would fail. We actually found out applications where uh, they were using Quorum and the, those calls will fail because it's Quorum across the regions. So what are the takeaways? What did we learn from it? The very first takeaway is this, right? Repairs after extension are very, very painful. So, um, and since you are doubling the data set and you are adding a new region which has never repaired before, it takes a long time. And we have few clusters which are, you know, hundreds of nodes and so that adds up. So it's very important that you, um, you understand that anytime you're adding a new region, uh, you have enough time for repairs. And remember in the process I was showing you that after repairing, actually there's a slide which is missing, because after repairing is the place where you can enable the applications in the new region so that they can start taking traffic, right? So it's only after repair that you should have your applications uh, ready to access the new region. So your whole migration time can very much depend upon the size of the cluster, the time it takes to repair, uh, so it's not just like you have to plan for this activity. Uh, time to repair of, yeah. Don't you decide whether to repair or rebuild? No, re you do rebuild for the historical data, but rebuild will not, doesn't mean that you should not repair. You definitely have to repair after rebuild as well, right? So repair is the, is the final thing in the whole, um, whole operation because rebuild will not make it very consistent across all the nodes. Rebuild is actually copying data, it's like similar to Bootstrap where it is getting data, but it matches the nearest hash and gets the data from that particular token, right? So it's, it's much, um, so you do definitely have to repair, even after rebuild. Uh, so time to repair depends upon the number of regions. We have few clusters where we are extending uh, four regions, so it does depend, it does actually repairs do, yeah. No, we did not have e nodes enabled. Yeah, we we yeah. Is there any reason for not enough testing? We have not tested v nodes yet. We don't know. Yeah, we, we still have to prove that it would work. For us personally, like we have a, like we have test in environment where we have to refresh from prod to test every week, and we have not figured out a story there because it's very difficult to um, do those backups and restores. So. So a time to repair also depends on the replicas. So we, since we are running an Amazon environment and we have three zones, we use three replicas. So that you know, we can take care of the zone outages, even if one zone completely goes down, we still are available, right? So that's why we actually have three replicas in each region. So for example, if we have four regions, you will have 12 replicas. So it, your repair time actually would increase. It also depends upon the data size, of course, right? The bigger the data set, uh, the more time it will take. More than the data size, it is the entropy, right? If you're changing your data a lot, time to repair would uh, increase. Yeah. Yes. We do. Yeah, we do. But the thing is like um, each use case is so different and even if we say it's better not to delete of course because I'll show you there is the problems with delete as well. Uh, but applications do have to use. They, that they, they, you know, and Cassandra delete works perfectly well because um, com compactions will clear off the tombstones and like as a service it is, it is designed for that, right? So um, we, we try to uh, stay away from any standardizing. We actually, it's a, full freedom and responsibility. We do tell them the basic guidelines, but it's up to the developers actually, right? So that way we are, we don't want to be the bottleneck basically. Our team uh, will tell the guidelines, we'll help them uh, work through the whole cluster and the design and all, but we will not impose any restrictions saying that, hey guys, don't do this or do this. Um, so the, the, this is very important uh, takeaway. Uh, you should adjust your GC Grace uh, before, after, I said after extension, it should be before extension. Um, that is an error in the slide. So GC Grace is actually a column family setting. Uh, it is defined in seconds and default it is 10 days. So you should definitely, since after a region is added, repairs take more time, you should definitely tweak your GC Grace so that 
it, the number of days fit the amount of time it will take you to repair the cluster. So uh, if, for example, um, for most of the clusters, 10 days should be fine. But if you have a very big cluster, uh, you should definitely increase your GC grace because the first time around, even if you have stats on how a single region repair was going on, how much time it was taking, you, it will increase. And that increase depends upon all the things I was saying in the previous slide. So uh, adjust your GC grace to accommodate the time to repair. Uh, this is another important factor, like beware of deleted columns, right? So at one, uh, so if you have an application which is tombs, like deleting columns at a very fast rate, you should be careful of increasing the GC grace because otherwise uh, you will have a row which is actually having a lot of tombstone data, which be, since you have increased the GC grace, it, they will not go away. And your row gets so big and you can run into heap issues. We had issues where we extended the GC grace, didn't realize that the app was actually underneath deleting so many times and it caused all kinds of heap issues because that all those tombstones have to be loaded up when the request is being served. Though the coordinator will not send you, show you the deleted data, but um, the, the, the replicas actually um, pass the data to the coordinator. So it adds to the heap issues quite a lot. Have a run book. Uh, this is very important because you definitely need to uh, make sure uh, whatever processes you have, um, they ideally should be automated and you, 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 there's no other way actually you can test all the scenarios. You definitely need to automate all the failure scenarios and we have all the monkeys as I was showing you before, the Simeon army where we test our failures. But sometimes fail, they, they also don't work, right? So you do definitely need run book and need to maintain that run book as and when your services are being added or you know, there are dependencies getting changed. Uh, plan for capacity. Uh, you, since you are doubling the whole uh, cluster and the region, the number of nodes will definitely increase. So you have to plan for capacity. You also have to make sure that you have enough uh, monitoring capacity because in our case what happened was we didn't realize that uh, though we were adding region, the box which we have, we were, we use Jenkins for our monitoring basically. And uh, that, that, the, that box actually was overwhelmed because we added whole set of new clusters and we increased the footprint. So the jobs were taking more time and there were more things to be monitored. So definitely plan for capacity when you have to uh, have this active, active implementation. Yeah. Rack, so th yeah, so in Amazon, rack is basically a zone. That's what you mean? So when do you add the node? Do you add the node after the previous position or multiple racks and multiple data centers? Yes. Do you need to add in terms of that, right? Yes, we actually, so yeah. Our uh, cluster size is such that like we have, since rack is data center, right? Uh, our cluster size is such that our data set is in all the zones. So what was your question? I didn't get it properly though. Yeah, when you are adding the node, let's say you can just add one node. Yes, so that's why in the first slide I was showing you, right? We had a three node cluster that was an example, but we brought up one node at a time. We brought up three nodes uh, in the other region as, as well, yeah. right? So if you have, let's say, three clustering nodes, right, in your present region, yes. you are adding the node, you'll be adding one here, one there, right? Oh, the, the, oh, yeah, yeah, that way you're saying. So we actually, we don't never add nodes, one node at a time. Like, wh what we do is we try to double the cluster. Because of the way our tokens are arranged, we don't just add two or three nodes. We actually double the cluster, but at the same time, we can bring one node at a time. Oh, we are not using the nodes, we are not using the nodes yes. Uh, consistency level, this is important. In multi-regional cluster, quorum is not equal to local quorum. Um, and quorum, as I was saying, one of, our, one of the applications we found out was using quorum calls, and it failed miserably, right? So it's very critical that you identify all your applications and make sure you are, you are not using quorum for consistency. Uh, we also had one very, um, like it was a little bit of surprise to us. Uh, so what happened is as soon as we had one region taking live traffic and uh, reads and writes are happening properly, no problems. So as soon as we added the new nodes in the other region uh, and rebuilt the cluster, we started seeing the 99th percentile latency in the main region uh, spiking up, right? And we didn't understand, we were saying, hey, and that was only happening for CL1 calls. 
So that was a surprise because we, we didn't understand why will CL1 go cross region. But there is an edge case, snitch can decide and actually throw some calls across and that's why your 99th gets tapered. So for this, um, uh, Jason Brown, he's a committer and he was at Netflix, he actually uh, created local one, he patched Cassandra in 6202 and uh, we recommend local one for reads so that your reads, for even when you're using CL1, you should use local one so that they are within the region and they are not going cross. And local quorum for writes. Um, you should definitely avoid all or quorum calls because that doesn't help in Cassandra, right? Um, and it will, it will lower your, uh, especially for a multi-regional setup, uh, it, it will actually cause problems. Yeah, so uh, we, we say like if your application can take the inconsistencies once a while or it's not impacted that much, you don't need very consistent data, you should definitely use one, right? CL1 or like local one in this case because that way your uh, reads will be much faster. But if you're a very sensitive application and you definitely want consistent data, you should use local quorum for reads and local quorum for writes. That way your data within that region is consistent and it gets repaired at the when it, you are making all those reads calls. Mm, cre create chaos, it, it, this is very important, right? Because you set up some application or this infrastructure, you need to make sure, does it work? Will it work when we have real failures? And we have all these Simeon Army tools which actually we use to create chaos and make sure whatever we decided worked. Uh, last but not the least, benchmark. Uh, it is time consuming, but it is worth it. And we learned a lot of lessons uh, doing the benchmarks and you know, doing all those validations, which uh, actually uh, helped us move to this active, active, and use Cassandra at the back end. Um, so we, we, do, we are considering as uh, Christos, if you have seen Christos' talk in the morning, we are, uh, we are considering options because we don't have uh, same thing for EU. EU has just one region. So we are looking at various ways where we can have an N plus one architecture in place where data is everywhere. So that is still in, uh, still to come.